Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 180 of Voices from the Bench. My name is still Elvis. And my name is still Barbara. <laughs> What's happening? Woo woo! 180 episodes. Crazy, know. huh? You know, I'm so proud of us. Super awesome. And I think we've gotten better, which is super important for those that have listened to our first 50. So, <laughs> man, I hope so. <laughs> well, you were always perfect, but. <laughs> Why well, won't go that far? <laughs> So recording this episode the Friday before a three-day weekend, you got major plans? Uh, no, which I absolutely love. My only major plans are I'm going to run and have some wine. Yeah, not drive a kid around. No. We're not doing that cool. anymore, unless he's totaled the car yet. No, he's doing really good. He's really responsible. Even when it rained the other day, he's kind of like, can you drop me off at my buddy's? And yeah, he's doing really good. Let's put him downtown Chicago <laughs> in the rain at night. I don't think so. <laughs> when I was in Chicago last weekend, I got lost trying to get back to the hotel. I was so pissed. Ugh. Just walking? Yes, I forgot my readers. So I had my map quest on and I couldn't see it. And I was just, it was a cluster. Barb, you just had readers and map quest. You sound so old. <laughs> oh, um, watch yourself. Honey. I am. My birthday's Friday. This Friday. Did you search on Yahoo or something? No. Sorry. But I made it. I was pissed. I made it. So how was that meeting up in Chicago during the race of the future? Fantastic. It was yeah. great. Yep. So you didn't stay for the race, though, right? No, I didn't stay for the race. Yeah, I saw some great pictures. Yes. Next year, I'm all in. Yeah, sure. do the whole thing. Yeah. I'm ready. Last weekend was Race of the Future 7.0, which, as we mentioned, Barb and I didn't do. Yep. But I heard that they raised over $70,000 for the Foundation of Dental Laboratory Technology during that event. Yep. Sure enough did. Awesome. Way to go, guys. Big thanks to all the racers, the sponsors, and the donators, or is it donors? Donors. And the donors who made this event such a successful one. That's awesome. But that same weekend, Uh I was at Lab Day West. I know you were. I saw you on Facebook in your lovely polka dotted black jacket. Yeah, you like that? Oh, yeah, I love it. Look like Elvis. Yeah, my wife picked that out. That's why it's good. Nice. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. So it was my first time at Lab Day West, and of course I was there with my new work family, Preet. It seemed pretty busy in an upbeat show. I mean, lots of traffic, most of it on Saturday, but they say it was about 80% of what it usually is. Hey, that's pretty darn good, to be honest. I say so. And I'll take that any day right now. Yeah. Good job, Judy. Yeah, it was right next to Disney, which, you know, I've never really been to. So because I wake up early on East Coast time, you know, it's, you know, I get up, it's like four o'clock. Yay. I actually ran around the park a few times. Well, how cool. So that was fun. A little I different. But it was. Yeah. That's why I love being a runner, because you get to go and see all that stuff. Yeah. I got to see Disney employees showing up to work, so people like in safari gear and pirate gear were like walking into work. It was interesting. Don't see that in Indiana. No. Nope. <laughs> But it was good to see friends, made some new ones, saw a few past podcast guests, which is always fun to see. Yeah. But a lot of people are asking if we were recording at the show. Yeah. Even Judy Fishman thought since I was there that we were recording. Yeah, we're getting a little busy the next three months. We're going to be all over the place. So yeah, maybe next year. I just uh, Yeah. I'm actually enjoying not traveling as much as I used to travel. So it's hard to get me out of town anymore. I get that from a lot of people. (laughs) Yeah. All right, so what's going on this week? So this week we talked to a lab owner out of Barlett, Tennessee. But we're just going to say Memphis because it's just easier. (laughs) Daxton Grubb from Ardent Dental Lab. I remember years ago when I first saw Daxton on stage, it was during a panel, and I think, Barb, you were even in it. I was the moderator, yep. Yeah, and each person got to give a little presentation about their lab for a few minutes. And I remember how much Daxton shared. It was really amazing. It was eye-opening to see a lab owner share as much as he did. Yeah. Well, he didn't let us down during this conversation, and he shares it and does it again. Daxon talks about taking over for his father with no on-the-bench training, 
the pros and cons of digital dentures, hiring dental assistants for roles in the lab, trying out vendor-supported techniques that don't always pan out. And he also talks about what's new with the lab so close to Graceland. So join us as we chat with Daxton Grubb. Whitmix offers you the ultimate in ease, material flexibility, and unattended production with the Roland DGA DWX 52 DCI milling machine. The popular mill's automatic disc changer expands your lab's production and profit. Using a 6-slot automatic disc changer, 15-station automatic tool changer, and several other automated features. The DWX52 DCI dental milling machine now comes with performance software and other intelligent updates. The 5-axis mill even knows which tool to automatically swap out when tools have reached their designated lifespan. Just power it on, let it go, and automatically and accurately mill numerous dental restoration jobs with complete unattended confidence. If you're interested in learning more about the Roland DGA DWX 52 DCI, visit Whitmix.com or call 1-800-626-5651. And as always, we appreciate your support of the podcast, Whitmix. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. Well, we would like to welcome to the podcast someone we should have had on probably a couple years ago, but we're happy to invite him on now, Daxton Grubb from Ardent Dental Lab. How are you today, sir? Man, I am doing wonderful. I did not get my coffee this morning, but other than that, I am ready to roll. Wait a minute. You don't, you haven't had your coffee? <laughs> I have not. No, actually, I've been taking a little uh, pre-workout and replacement of coffee, trying to wean myself. So it's it's been a slow process, but I'm making progress for sure. How can you get rid of coffee? I know this is dental podcast, but that's <laughs> all about dental is coffee. Oh my god. Well, I think I'm just kind of substituting one caffeine for another, basically. I mean, it's just yeah. I feel like I've been drinking too much coffee in the morning. I mean, I'll have three or four cups, and it's just I, I don't know. I'm trying to pay a little bit better attention to my health and my working out and all that. Fantastic. I don't exercise unless I have coffee. I mean, if I could if I could run with a cup of coffee, I would. <laughs> I feel like I was basically exercising to get coffee because I was drinking so much of it. So. Uh, well, good luck to you. <laughs> Whatever burns the calories, right? Yep. <laughs> well, that's all we got for you. To, no, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> nice talking to y'all. I'll see y'all next week. <laughs> so, Daxton, obviously, you're well-known in the industry. Ardent. I've seen you on stage a couple times telling the Ardent story. Mm-hmm. You didn't start it. It was your father, correct? Correct. Yeah, so yep. tell us that story. How'd that happen? Well, my father got into the industry in like 1971, and he was actually considering going to dental school and realized that that part was going to be a little bit more difficult for him as far as on the act, you know, going to school and all that. But he had a, a passion for, you know, working with his hands and, you know, had that artistry side of it. So he kind of eased into the, the tech side and worked for a couple of big corporate labs here in Memphis for a few years. And he had a couple of clients that talked him into opening his own lab. And he did in 1978. It was just a, you know, start out a small Crown and Bridge lab, like most of those guys back then, you know, in their garage. <laughs> And oh then yeah. <laughs> moved to the upstairs of another house and over the years I'd say from you know basically 78 until you know probably early 2000 when I joined about 2001 2002 you know he just kind of maintained about 8 to 10 employees you know Crown and Bridge only typical lab that size how they ran were you know pretty much all roads led through my father you know mm-hmm. I mean, he probably you know he had 8 employees but he did 90% of the work and Oh yeah. That was kind of what I saw growing up. You know, I'd go up there and cut the grass, you know, at the lab and do odd and end jobs and never thought I would ever be interested in the dental technology side of things. And for one, I just saw how hard he worked. I mean, he lived at the lab. I mean, it was, you know, he was there, come home for dinner, go back up there and, you know, working pretty late weekends. I mean, mm. long weekends. But I, you know, graduated from college from CBU in 1999 and I had all my prerequisites for, for medical, for pre-dental, I mean, pre-med. And you know, I was kind of considering, you know, going into dentistry. I originally worked at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, which just so happened to be the only job that had a paid internship. So really cool for me when in college, because I was like, hey, I'll do an internship and get paid. 
little bit of money. And I, so I, I stayed on with Enterprise for a few years, became an area manager there. Renting cars. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I've never met someone in that industry. <laughs> well, hey, and I'll tell you this because, I mean, it's, it's important for, you know, lab owners to know that the management training that that company gives is phenomenal. Really? I mean, I, Interesting. It's unbelievable. The management and sales training, I mean, I've, I've always highly recommended looking to hire, you know, when you're looking for sales reps or even, you know, management type people, it is unbelievable the training that they give there. So I, I learned a whole lot mm. I mean, I, the, the years I was there. It's funny because a lot of people that hear a rental company and, you know, you think of it as like some, you know, rinky dink job that doesn't pay much, but I've got, you know, I've got some guys that, that are still there when I work that are making seven figures. I mean, it's Whoa. crazy. Wow. Like it's a, you know, good company, but anyway, it was the big corporate mentality and it was hard for me. I, I you know, as y'all know, I, I don't have much of a filter. If I think something, I'm going to say it. And I, that was, uh, <laughs> That's why you're on the podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I'm happy, I'm going to speak. And if I'm mad, I'm going to speak too. So anyway, my dad was struggling around that time at the lab. You know, he needed some help. And I was, again, considering going into dentistry. So I joined him and was going to help him on, you know, kind of get the business in a better position and, and really help him kind of drum up a little bit of business and then also figure out if dentistry was going to be for me. So I went out and visited a couple of dentists that my dad, you know, kind of connected me with mm -hmm. to, to go to the side and see. One of them was an oral surgeon, of course, which was probably a big mistake. Yeah. I realized within about, within about three seconds when I, you know, walked in that operatory and saw he had a patient flapped open. I mean, I could still Oof. remember exactly. And I was like, there is no way that I had to <laughs> so, Reality check. <laughs> yeah, so it was a real quick decision on that part. But, you know, I went back and continued to help my dad and, and really never really thought of myself as being good in sales. But, you know, I had to, you know, create all my own literature. And of course, you know, a lot of it was on like cardboard paper, you know, it looked very generic at that time, but was really just getting all of that stuff going from a sales and marketing standpoint, going out networking with the clinical reps and just, you know, really started growing the business and it was fun and I was enjoying it. Felt like I was, you know, pretty good at it. And over the next several years, I was kind of balancing back and forth between, you know, going out and growing the business. And of course, you know, my dad, I was getting more in than what they could handle. So that was a whole nother issue, right? Learning how to, to hold back as needed because it's still the problem today. It, it still isn't easy to find, you know, experienced help as I know y'all know that as well. Sure, yeah. Probably now harder than ever, actually. Yeah. But that was kind of basically the way it went, uh, you know, for uh, leading up until now. We Well, I, let me step back. One of the first things I did when I was going out and calling on doctors was look into removal because my dad wasn't doing removal at the time. And it seemed like every office I was calling on trying to sell Crown and Bridge, all they wanted was removable. Mm -hmm. So I opened a removal apartment, I guess, about a year after I'd been there. And, the, and it just took off. I mean, it was we started with two people. And I think today we've got about 20 20 or 20 or 22 technicians in that department. And removable? Wow. wow. Yeah. There just wasn't a whole lot of competition. There was a huge need in this area. So it was really, that helped grow, you know, Crown and Bridge as well. So, you know, I've always been, as y'all know, I've been very passionate and interested in the high tech side of things. I'm not a dental technician. I did start our CAD CAM department probably back in 2005, 2006 with the old Procera Forte scanner and mm. adding a Serac mill after that. So, I started that for us, but I had no, you know, technical experience. I mean, all I knew pretty much was what a margin looked like or should look like. And, and I knew, you know, I, I kind of learned the anatomy from going through PTC, enjoyed getting that started. Definitely. We got, we were early adopters of kind of the, the digital impression side, 3d printing. I mean, we were one of the first labs to really get heavily into 3d printing models. And that was kind of a niche for us in growing our digital impression side of our business. So anyway, that's kind of, you know, pretty much the journey I took over the lab. Actually, this year, my father and I completed the transition over to me. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. So that's been, you know, kind of a long process getting that going. But we're today, we're about uh, 67 or so people, you know, fix removable implants, pretty much do everything in house. We do outsource our abutments and our cast frames, but pretty much everything else is done here in house. So wow. our dent... Is that named after your dad, Randy? Yeah. So the lab was Randy Grubb Dental Lab. And, you know, I knew that name. It just, you know, it sounds mom and pop pretty, you know, yeah. to yeah. me. But, so we were changing the name and I told my dad he can keep something out of it. So I let him keep the R. So he got Aww. to keep the R. <laughs> so that was kind of the, the history on that. Nice. So when you were growing up, I mean, you obviously went into the lab as a kid, mm -hmm. but did he encourage you to come into the lab or did you? Oh, no. No. Uh -uh. 
Yeah. No, he never did. I mean, my dad kind of always was, you know, I mean, I, I think just how hard he was working, he didn't want to see me work as hard as he did. Yeah. So I think, there was a, and that was one of the things too, when I, when I came on, he was very, he was adamant about me not learning the technical side. He was like, man, he's like, as soon as you learn how to do this, he's like, I, he's, you know, no disrespect, but you're going to end up like me. You'll end up doing it. <laughs> yep. And, and so he was all, that was the one, one of the few things that he just was, you know, from the beginning was like, I'm not going to let you get over here. And, 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 you know, my tendency was to try to do that, you know, especially on the sales and marketing side, you know, when we were getting over capacity and having problems, right. I mean, that's usually what happens. Sure, yeah. if, then I was like, man, I got to get in there and, and learn it and fix it. And he was like, no, no, you can't do it because it'll just be, the, it'll be the end. You'll never go back. Yeah. You'll never leave the bench. Yeah. So, and you know, I didn't ever want to really do that anyway. That's not me. I mean, I'm not an artist. I'm not really, you know, good, that good with my hands. Like, so I, I don't think I ever really would have been good. I probably have been okay because I would have made myself be okay, but I wouldn't have been great. Yeah. So yeah. it's probably the, the, the smart. <laughs> <laughs> He never pushed me to do that. Yeah. Do you have any brothers or sisters that are in the lab now? Or are you only child? Yeah. So I've got one sister. She's older. She's uh, five years older than me. And she is here. She's been here since high school. She's a technician. She kind of can do a little bit of everything in fix. But for the most part, you know, now, like right now, she's doing dye trimming. She's been in CAD CAM back and forth. She first was a waxer. So like a full contour waxer. So she's kind of more like on the, you know, on the Crown and Bridge side. But yeah, she's. She's here. That's a nice mix. Yep. I work with my sister as well, and she's in sales. And so it's kind of like I was a technician, she's in sales, but we both fell in love with it. Yep. So your first role when you came on was sales. You actually went out and sold to dentists. And yep. how was that learning curve for you? Man, it was tough. It's a lot different than renting cars. <laughs> Man, well, you know, my dad is awesome. I mean, he's a, he's a great technician, but he is, again, I'll, I'll say he's like a lot of these other guys of his age, he was not really good on the business side. You know I mean? Yeah. He was horrible actually. Yep. And so he yep. wasn't able to really like help me as I'm like trying to figure out like what's the best approach to grow. So a lot of this stuff, I just had to just try things, you know, I just kept trying stuff. Like one of the things I had him do, which I realized real quickly, this was a, a bad mistake was I had him make me some samples, you know, and which was cool. My dad made some samples that were phenomenal. I mean, now, the problem was, is we could have never replicate. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm getting these samples and I'm taking these things out. And, you know, these doctors are like, wow. I mean, this was like what a high end lab would produce. Yeah. But yet we're in lab. And so, of course, they're like, you know, asking me questions like, man, you guys, did y'all do this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did it. And so, and of course, my dad wasn't able to understand that either. You know, I mean, you would have thought that he would realize like, OK, if I send this out and people want it. I got to replicate this over and over again. Every time. Yeah. So yeah, that was one of the hard lessons, you know, I learned with that. So it, it was, I think that one was my first kind of big lesson in sales. The other one was when I'd go out and call on, you know, doctors and they're having problems with labs. First thing I would always, you know, I just lick my chops, you know, the doctor's like, man, you know, I'm using so-and-so lab and you know, nothing ever fits. I'm like, oh man, everything's going to fit with us. And yeah. so like, if they ever having problems, I'm just would assure them there's no way that that's going to happen here. And I've kind of learned over time. I'm like now, especially when I know the labs that they're using are reputable, you know, cause I mean, we know like, especially like my competitors, I mean, I know the ones that are reputable labs and, you know, we all go through peaks and valleys, right? I mean, especially with staffing and all that, oh, where sure. we're, we may not be on our A game, we may be on our C game, but for the most part, when they're using one of my reputable competitors and they're telling me things like, yeah, nothing ever fits. Like now I'm kind of like, before I just go dive in, I'm like, all right, let's, let, let, let me get some of these cases. Like, let me, let me, maybe you can send me some of these cases and send me some of that model work and let me try to, yeah. you know, reverse engineer this to see if we would have the same outcome or a different outcome from the same pressure. And, and that has really helped us a lot because I'm sure as y'all know too, a lot of times it's, you know, Them. I'm not saying it's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's just like in a relationship, you know, you're having a problem and you know, you need to figure out is it you first because you got to take you with you yeah. wherever you go. And I think that was another kind of a hard lesson that, you know, I learned and, I, and it's helped because who wants to bring on a doctor that just is having a major issue that they just won't listen. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, that takes up a lot of bandwidth and, and it's, and it's expensive bringing on a new account. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a lot of cost and time and, you know, opportunity costs with that. So so I think that was another 
really big lesson that I learned pretty early on. Yeah, you get that call from that dentist that says, I've used every lab in the area and they can never do it right. Yeah. Can you? And you're like, "Ah, I'm not stepping in that boat. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I think that's, you know, the smart way to, to go about it. And, you know, now I do think that there's more and more pressure on labs than it was back then that we've got to be better trainers and educators, which is, yeah. which I know for us has been tough because we've got technical managers, you know, they're able to troubleshoot things like that, but they're, you know, they're over capacity in their roles. And so creating like a training department has been really hard. I mean, we've, I've recently hired a, a dental technician that that's all that she does. I mean, I'm sorry, dental assistant, that that's all that she does. I mean, she's a, she was a 20 year experience, a phenomenal dental assistant that we've created a bunch of PowerPoints and things. And she goes out and does lunch and learns and kind of works from down on our doctor list with shade doctors that have shade issues and things like that. And it has been really well received so far because she's going out and actually working with the dental assistants anyway, because they're the ones that are doing 90% of this stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Whether we know it or not, right. Whether it's, Hey, whether it's legal or not for them, it's still what's happening. I feel like in most situations. So, so, but I think that that part of the lab is where we're all having, whether we want to do it or not, we're having to focus resources onto that side so that we can help these doctors when they're having trouble, you know, cause we can't just grow our business picking up good doctors. I mean, if that's how we're going to do it, we're all, you know, SOL. Yeah. We're all going to go through them eventually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was actually uh, my next question when you were talking about the doctors that said they had a previous lab and that, you know, and they had issues with them, what you were doing. So you actually went out and hired a dental assistant and she goes to your clients and teaches them about impressions and shades and all of that, huh? Yeah, this is new. She's been here. She's on about her third month. And, you know, I'd had an on-staff clinician for about four years, and he re-retired about two years ago, but we never filled that position. And honestly, I don't know if I would go back down that road again. I feel like it was really, really hard for us to manage that. Um, oh, I bet. Yeah. I mean, he was basically a prostodontist, and, and, of course, he knew how to do everything right, mm-hmm. but his way was going to be a long way. And, you know, most of our doctors are like, look, I'll, I'll listen to this guy but he's got to give me a quicker route than taking me around the block three times to get somewhere. I don't, I can. Oh yeah. And so it, it, to me, I think, I think the dental assistant route makes a, a lot of sense. It usually is. Like I said earlier, it's the dental assistants that are, especially with removable that are handling all this stuff anyway. Mm-hmm. So if we can train them and get them to understand the whys and a lot of the stuff, then, you know, that we don't really have to worry about the dentist as much, yeah. you know, shoot, they can train the dentist if, if it needs to be right. I mean, so, <laughs> But so, yeah, that's where we've been really excited. We've seen really good results so far with that. But I mean, like I said, it's still relatively new process, but I think it's a good approach. So does she do any sales or is she just troubleshooting? No, right now, what our, what our plan for, for her is, is we're starting an impression scoring system where every impression that comes in, we're giving it a grade from one to five. Mm. And so she's been a part of getting that rolled out. And we haven't made it live with our doctors yet. We've basically just been doing it internally for, I guess it's about a month and a half. Hmm. But, you know, the idea will be that every doctor will get a grade, you know, each month. And it's something that we'll, you know, for our groups and all that, we'll publish back to them. And so it's a, you know, it's an objective measure that hopefully will be before, you know, we look at remakes. So it can catch remakes before they start becoming remakes. So you're going to send an, a report card back to a dentist that says your impressions are all one? Oh, we call them on the one. The ones are the ones that we cannot proceed further. Yeah. So if it's a one, they get called on it and they know it's a one. But yeah, the, the idea is that each month and over time, they'll have a score, whether it's 3.5 or 4.2, you know, that we will we'll keep on file. And, you know, for the ones that want to know, I mean, I, I don't really know yet if we're just going to give it to every person, if we just make it an option, you know, yeah. because my groups are the ones that are really wanting this. Okay, I see what you mean, like DSOs kind of thing. Yeah. So anyway, she's doing that, and then she's not doing any sales yet. I've got so many things that I want to do with her. I mean, it's like yesterday we were talking about getting her certified to do conversions. Um, so, But we're like, I mean, it's her bandwidth, you know, and, and oh, I can yeah. always build and add another one, but I'm kind of like, you know, we, we want to keep her on what's the greatest return on time with her for now, and I believe that it is – you know, developing these customized presentations that we're doing on all the major trouble areas that we have. And then, you know, her work in our list of who are our top shade problem doctors, top impression doctors, and like setting up lunch and learns and going out there to see them. That it's been, 
everybody's been really receptive to that so far. Yeah. You know, nobody yeah. she's reached out to yet has, has shot her down. And I think this is kind of a good route. And it gives us something, too, to talk about the doctors. Like, like what are we trying to do to help them become better? Because that's I think that's a key value value add. So everybody out there struggling to find really good employees. How did you find her? So, well, she's basically a good friend of mine. We go to church together. She's worked for one of my best dentists for, shoot, as long as I've been in the industry. And that dentist just recently sold to another dentist who does not work with me and who I do not have a very good relationship with. And then she was ready to leave because of who bought the practice. So we just actually had a discussion. It was actually in church. And she was like, hey, I'm looking to do something else. And we were just kind of talking back and forth. And I was like, man maybe we need to talk first. And it was real quick. It was that week. We ended up putting a job description together and here she is. Wow. So in other words, luck. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> Without a doubt, that one was definitely luck. A hundred percent luck. I wasn't looking, thinking it was one of those opportunities that I wish I had some technicians that kind of fell on me in this same situation. Yeah. It's been many years since I've had that kind of luck happen on a, on finding a technician, but yeah, that, that one was luck for sure. <laughs> yeah. Are you guys um, at your lab and in, in your location struggling like the rest of us to find technicians? That's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Bad. Real, I'd say real bad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we can go into description about that if you want, but it's been, it has been really, really tough for us. Is everybody just working a heck of a lot of overtime and weekends to compensate? I mean, that's kind of what we're doing. I mean, there's really no other choice. Yeah, I mean, you know, trying to outsource some stuff that we can. We've, we've got a couple like of ceramists that actually work at other labs in town that are coming here and working a few hours at night and doing some, you know, pay, piece pay. Yep. So that's just a little bit of relief. But, you know, I, I don't really like that setup very well. You know, I just I don't feel like it's it's something that we can really count on, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing, you know, and, and the hardest part, which you know, Barb, I'm, I'm sure you're having to do this at your lab is my managers are at the bench so yeah. much. Mm -hmm. They cannot even look left or right. So that is probably one of my biggest concerns is, I mean, they're, they're willing to get in and do it. Of course it's burning them out, but the biggest issue is, is they can't manage. Yeah. And in my lab, we're not real deep on management and the technical departments. We don't have like a, you know, a manager an assistant manager and a backup. I mean, it's, it's lean. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it makes that really, really hard. So yeah, it and that's that way for us in, in really all three departments, fixed removal and implant. And I've got four basically four different headhunters that have been looking, you know, for a few months for us. And and the hard part I think is is like place like Memphis, I mean it's not I think people that are looking to move or make a change, but there's a lot of people apparently making changes right now, moving to other labs, you know, I think they're looking at like where do I want to go? And unfortunately I think places like Memphis is not like a an area that somebody's like, Hey, I just, man, I just always want to live in Memphis. Yeah, you know, yeah. I had the same problem in Indianapolis. <laughs> I can't compete yeah. with labs in Florida. Yeah. It's, just, <laughs> it really is. it's, it's like Florida, it's East coast, West coast. Yeah. You know I mean? Somebody, that, somebody that's living up North and they want to move down South, you know, they kind of do want to go to the coast, you know, so that is probably the biggest issue I think that we're running into because there's some candidates out there, but if your location is not in an area that, is appealing, then that's the bigger issue than, than actually what, you know, finding the pay rate and all those types of things to get them here. Yeah. Right. Is it mostly like seating and finishing zirconia, glazing, layering, or is it just, I mean, obviously implants is taken off and removable stuff to find, yeah. but are you struggling in the seat and finish and layering areas too? Oh yeah. I mean, definitely like I'd say our biggest bottlenecks or biggest, you know, areas that we need help is in the you know, setups, like most people. Yeah. I mean, denture setups is a bottleneck. Ceramics is a, is a bottleneck. More so on layering ceramics than, <laughs> you know, than contour and full contour zirconia. Yeah. We've got a trainer here and we get, you know, some decent people off the street. You know, we can get them contour and zirconia relatively quick, you know, where they're, they're at least okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. The teaching, and as y'all know, finding, teaching somebody how to layer ceramics is like, and set denture teeth. I mean, it's just. It's a skill. Yeah. Yeah. There's no quick fix to that. And for us, even trying to, we're trying to find people internally that we could move from another department. And, you know, we've got some decent staining glazers that we think are pretty close to being able to move in ceramics, but we just, you know, I just kind of keep crossing my fingers and hoping, I mean, we could probably hand, we could, we could use a couple of decent ceramists like right now. And yeah. the same thing with a couple of decent setup technicians. Wow. 
those are the main areas for us. I mean, CAD, you know, CAD design, we outsource a pretty good bit of that. And, and, you know, I know there's a, there's been a lot of talk with a, you know, a, a particular company out there that's been taking a lot of designers that not from me, but a lot of my buddy labs I've been talking to. And that has kind of even made me a little bit more worried about trying to, you know, develop or hire or bring in, you know, really good CAD designers. It's definitely not a dandy situation. Well, there's lots of choices. No. So, so yeah, you, that, 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 uh, that's a situation that I think is probably going to continue to be a, an area that we're, we're going to have to pay very close attention to is our in-house designers. Yeah. yeah. I think the you know, whether it's the pay rates going to go up with them or just having to deal with new competitors and, and that are going to try to take them from us. Yeah. It's not really necessarily just other normal labs. Right. I mean, yeah. But with your problem with setup technicians, don't you just fix that with digital dentures? Isn't that what everybody's doing? <laughs> Man, we're trying. I mean, we're trying with that. Yeah. I mean, and that, you know, we're doing premium denture through carbon and we, we're also doing our economy denture through Envision Tech now. And, you know, it's, it is just not taken off for us the way that we're hoping, because you're right, that should be the answer, right? Is, I mean, we're moving the setups to digital dentures, but we keep running into doctors that don't like the monolith, you know, the try-ins, yeah. for instance. It's a variety, you know, the aesthetics, right? I yep. mean, some of the doctors, they just don't feel like the aesthetics are good enough. And for me, I'm like, if we're going to do a digital denture, I think that we, we need to keep it digital. Like if we're going to take the digital denture out and start enhancing it, then that kind of takes away the whole purpose of doing it because... To me, the biggest one of the biggest values of the digital denture is being able to replicate that same denture one year down the road or whenever that is, because you've got it on file. Well, as soon as you take that denture out and you start putting all that customization and characterization on it, I mean, you're not going to be able to replicate that exact denture no. when you just file and print. And so I think that's something that we got to keep in mind is one of the major selling points to doctors is that is that ability. Yeah. So we're being stubborn about it and, and saying, you know, if we can't make that denture when it comes out and through the through the the characterization and stuff that we do in the cad side if we can't keep it that way then maybe that's not as good of a solution as what we think or we're going to be setting ourselves up for a major problem right in a year or two three from now when they're when they're wanting those replica dentures and they get the one that we print out and they're like uh this looks nothing yeah. like the one you have. yeah well when you introduced it to your doctors did you sell it as a separate item because a lot of labs kind of just replaced their denture with digital didn't really have a choice to the dentist well here's the thing with that we tried to do it that way and i and that's why i priced them the same mm -hmm. so my digital denture is the same price as my standard denture mm -hmm. and we did that from the very beginning because we wanted to be able to do that we wanted to pick and choose but the problem is i think that works out fine until the doctor gets something back that that is different to them right i mean yeah. it's kind of like it's kind of like scanning impressions and fixed, right? The doctors don't really care that you print a model and it's purple, it's green or whatever until they notice that something is different that they don't like. And now they're saying it's that model. It's that printed yeah. model, you know? Yeah. And so for us, I think that was where we started running into problems and it was on the try-in, yeah. you know, and we were trying out if there was something that they did not like about that try-in, even though we told them like, Hey, you can grind on it. You can do, you know, modify it and take a bite on it and just send it back and rescan it. I mean, that's really been our biggest issue. I mean, and when they kick back on that, they're like, no, nah, I just want the other one, you know? Yeah. And if you can't do that, then, you know, we might have a problem. So I, I don't know. That's kind of been where we are. We're doing, you know, we do a handful, maybe four or five a day, which is, I mean, a fraction of our volume, sure. of digital, but we're not giving up on it. We're still, we're marketing it heavy. You know, we, we've got a big group that we're going to be meeting with one of our big groups that does probably more dentures than any other, any other group that we have. And we're going to revisit it with them. The problem is, is they were the group that I went after two years ago when we went gangbusters with digital dentures. And it was like, I mean, they had everything go wrong. I mean, oh, this yeah. was, this was one of the first generation materials, which I don't, I don't know. If I won't mention the name, but they were breaking like constantly. They were wearing out like super fast. I yeah. mean, we were getting these dentures back in like a year and it was crazy how fast they were wearing. So so this, this group was like, we're done. So I haven't been able to kind of go back to that, you know, and really revisit until we feel really, really good. And so we're going to, we're going to try to go back to them now, two years later, basically, and, and yeah. get them going. But no, it's, I, I agree with you, Elvis. It's got to be this. It has to be the solution on dentures. Yeah. The industry cannot produce, I mean, the, the setup technicians are retiring and dying faster than we can ever 
dream of replacing them. So if digital is not the solution and, you know, of course we've got a growing demand for it too, right? I mean, uh, uh, the baby boomers oh, and everything, yeah. Yeah. it's definitely a real problem that digital has got to be the solution. So yeah, I wish I could share more success but, <laughs> than what we've had. Well, I also think it's interesting your perspective of it not being successful. I mean, yeah. I find that just as interesting because we have people on this podcast that say, oh, I'm doing digital dentures. It's the only thing I do. It's the greatest thing ever. But it doesn't always work. Mm-hmm. You know, I was never able to get it at our lab. Never. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just one of those things we just got to keep pushing. I mean, we believe in it. I mean, so I think that's the key, right? If, if the lab, if you believe in it yourself, because if my manager wasn't behind it, then there's no way that we would do any of them. Sure. He, he definitely believes in it. I don't know. I think, I just think the try-in for us is going to, we're going to have to come up with a better solution. We've tried all kinds of different things on the try-in, but I think that's kind of our main, our main hiccup right now is on the try-ins. Well, you got to get your dental assistant out there believing in it and yeah. she'll sell it. Yeah. So that's definitely a plan. She's already gotten her presentation put together on how the angle that she's going to go. So we've already got that one queued up and she'll, she'll be good at it because she definitely believes now that she's here because she, you know, they hated doing dentures at her office. And a lot of the things that they hated about them was, right, you took eight appointments to get the patient satisfied. Yeah. I think digital, if the doctors can give us what we need, which I, that's, that's true with everything. They can give us what we need on the first appointment then everything's easy. But I think with digital, I think that's one of the angles that we, we, we got to dangle with them is like, we can give you this. Yeah. You've got to give us everything we need, you know, on the records up front. Yeah. You got to do more than just an impression rated one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Got to be a little bit what? better than that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Are there anything uh, in new material wise? I know we've all been like cooped up for a year, but is there anything that you guys are doing or introduced this past six months that uh, is new for your lab? Well, I mean, something that's new for our lab, it's definitely been out there for a while, but we've, we've been pretty stubborn to get it going has been Mio. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Barb loves her Mio. <laughs> yeah, we're huge fans of Mio. Yeah. We were using it like on our full arch implant bridges, you know, going back two, three years ago, because I have one of my ceramists that is really good with it. But as far as like using it on all of our, you know, full con- our regular bread and butter work and all that, we had a real stiff learning curve with some of the people that were here at that time. And, and of course, a lot of those, most of those people are gone now. Yeah. So we've got the crews. And so when we showed them like what you could do with this, like they're, I mean, they, they were so excited about the versatility of that material and kind of like really creating, you know, ceramist out of your staining glazer. So I think it's really been cool to see how they've taken hold of it. And it's, I mean, I think the quality of our work has definitely increased from using it. So that's probably been the biggest, the biggest product, I would say that, that as far as new product, we did add another model, model printer. We bought the origin model printer mm-hmm. about eight months ago and, and have been real happy with it. Of course, we've got carbon as well. But the, the origin, I think, gives us a, a pretty comparable quality and consistency and model, but uh, it's a much more aggressive, I guess is the best word, priced yeah. uh, material. Sure, sure. So we've been real happy with that as far as technology. Yeah. You know, it's kind of really been it, I mean, as far as new, new materials. I mean, we added the Envision Tech printer. Like I said, we are doing that with our uh, economy dentures, which I'm very, very happy with what's coming out of it. We're using it for economy dentures. It's a really, that Flexera material is a really, really cool material. It's super strong and we can price it, you know, in that economy range yeah. as well. So how do you stay ahead of the curve, you know, especially when there's no meetings going on to stay up with all the new technology? Are you in any of those um, lab groups or do you meet with other labs and talk about things? I know that you've got a lot of friends in the industry, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not really in, I'd say for the past couple of years, I, you know, I haven't really been in any groups it's kind of it's almost it's been a i I miss it but i I still yeah to your point i mean i've got a pretty good network of key lab owners gms across the country that that i'm very thankful for that we share information like fully transparent back and forth i mean whatever and you know whether it's materials or staffing or or whatnot and and that's that's really helped me a lot i mean especially when you know just being able to call people who you look at you know who i look up to and i respect and you can you know, when, when you're struggling, right? I mean, yeah. we're all, anybody that's trying to say that they're not struggling to some extent right now, I mean, is, I don't know, I don't know if it's even possible, but, you know, and you pick up the phone and you share, you know, people that you look up to and you're like, hey, I'm really struggling with this. And you can, and you know, you, you know that they're going to be telling you the truth back. I mean, it's, yeah. it's simple to say that, but in this industry, I, I kind of found that real quick. A lot of people, 
they want to hold information to them and they, or they're going to tell you that everything's always wonderful. And you're like, man, if you've been growing it's 5% <laughs> every year, like you say, you would probably be about 10 times the size that you really are. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's just stuff like that. It's using my, my network has, has probably been the, the thing I relied on the most. Yeah. And I'm thankful for that. And that's yeah. one of the greatest things about our industry. Yeah. You know, when I lecture, I try to tell that to people too, that it's, I mean, it's out there for everybody. You know, you just, the thing is, you got to be humble yourself, right? I mean, you're going to go to somebody and, and try to develop that relationship. Well, you know, people, most people, most of us can kind of sniff it out if you're full of crap or you're not being transparent yourself or, or your motives are not pure. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I think as long as you've got that and, you know, you can keep that reputation within the industry. Cause I think, you know, we all, all three of us probably know many people in the industry that are out there. They've ruined their name, you know, because they've done things that are unethical or they're, you know, yeah. they're not, they're not transparent or they, their, their motives are not pure when they're reaching out and trying, you know, trying to develop those relationships. And it's, I, I think once you get, Oh, everybody. Okay. I'm good. That was me. I, I tripped over my computer. Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> are you pacing, Barb? Are you are you nervous? I don't know what the hell I did. I like had a, like a freak out for some reason. I'm sorry. Was your computer okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who cares about you, Barb? What about the computer? Yeah. Are we good? I didn't even know y'all could hear that. That's hilarious. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, that that's just kind of what I'd say about that. I mean, I, I think that's the key thing is people. You want to develop those relationships. Just pay close attention because this is a very close, tight knit industry. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. and everybody shares that information so it's hard to go back once you hurt your name right yeah hell yeah once you make or disclose something untrue or you know just bs yeah Yeah, i i agree and that's one of the things that i admire about you i remember when you and i first met we did the um nadl meeting and you know you were just so forthright and you know everything that you could to share what what was happening in your laboratory and super truthful yeah is that when you guys did a panel at visions I remember that panel. I, I couldn't remember which one. Oh, God. We had a lot of fun the night before, and we kicked butt on the panel. But yes, that's how we <laughs> met. That was great. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I remember that. We were all surprised you guys made it to the panel. Let's just say. Yeah. Hey, always there to work, Elvis. I never <laughs> let my work down. Never. I'll never forget those lights. That was like the brightest light. It was like the, <laughs> sun, the sun was actually in that <laughs> Oh, yeah. Good times. Good times. But yeah, so I remember you very fondly for that because that was a great experience and a lot of sharing. So so you're definitely who you say you are. That's for sure. So Daxon, I wanted to ask you, and by all means, I don't even know if it's still a product anymore and you can say you can't talk about it. But I remember Zon came out a few years ago with a guide that prepped and you pre-made the crown. Does this sound familiar? I did that. Yeah. <laughs> you did that, Barb? Yes. Okay. Did they still make that? Is that still a thing? I'll let Dax uh, answer. I'll keep. Well, I'm trying to think of a nice way to put this. <laughs> for one, I don't know. For two, I don't care. So you uh, don't do it anymore? No, I never did. Like we, no. no, I went through the first, like the first group, and we went up there and we're looking at it. And you know, the, the concept kind of was neat. Yeah, but. You know, w- there were some major problems with that system and they could never really address any of the, the problems that we were presenting. And yet they still were wanting us to, you know, sign up and, and pay all this money and become a, a part of it. I started just kind of laughing about it, honestly, because it was to me, you know, that, that group, again, we were all kind of sharing our, our, our what Failure. was happening. <laughs> Failure. I was about to say success, but we were sharing our failures yeah. and we're like, you know, are, are these people crazy? Like, why is this still going? And so, yeah, they came and, and there was a pretty decent investment. I actually think a few labs made the investment. Mm-hmm. Barb, I don't know if you were one of them, but, they were, but, yeah. but they were expecting to get just, I know one of the lab owners that, would, that did pay the money to get in was like, hey, look, I don't even care if it doesn't work. I just want to get a part of the, the branding and marketing. And I was like, well, man, why do you want to, if it don't work, it's not going to be good marketing. Yeah. So I've, done my fair share of putting things out there that end up not working. And in the end, you kind of like, I would have been better off if I'd never, ever, ever, you know, been a part of that. And so, so yeah, I backed out of that and tried to make me feel bad and all that, but I definitely know that was the right decision for us. I haven't heard anything about it. it, But you were the lab that I saw, I don't know, on social media or something posted. That's what I was going to ask you, Elvis. How did you know that? That's where I saw it about the same time. 
somebody reached out to our lab about doing it. And that's where I tried to make the connection. I was like, what is this? Why would I want to do this? Yeah. And I didn't realize you never took it on. I thought you did. No, actually, I was the first one in the group that actually got, I had a doctor that we signed up and got certified and he was doing a couple of cases and it was like a total embarrassment. Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't seem like it makes sense. Well, it, the thing was that the only indication that it actually made sense and it worked was for veneers. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and, I get that. Yeah. And the problem was, and so it was like, you know, you sign up for all this and I'm like, we don't do a, a whole lot of veneers at my lab. I mean, the price for the doctor was like, I don't know. It was like 350 of a veneer or something. It was crazy. Oh, wow. I was like, man, I'm not going to be able to pull that off, first of all. And then, to me, the real value of that was going to be on, like, a single unit posterior crown. And that was the one indication that they had the most issues with. And I was like, man, this is, just doesn't make sense. I mean, the one thing I need to be to work is, is, like, a one to three unit posterior bridge. Yep. And that one, they were like, oh, well, you know, that one's going to be a while. You know, but we got the veneer. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> So, Barb, what are you doing? Like 300 of them a day over there? Oh, no, we're not doing them. Are you no, kidding you're not me? doing them either? No, I had the exact same experience. And um, yeah, I never really could picture it working, but, you know, they were trying to get us involved. And so, yeah, we kind of got on the bandwagon, but I was the same as Dax. And we we're just like, this is just not where we need to go. You know, you need it for single and three unit bridges. And, you know, the veneers is not what we needed. So, yeah. That's a political question, Elvis. Well, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah. Always stir in the pot. That's what I do. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm a pot stirrer too. I tried to. I try to get better about that in my uh, past few years about not just you know stirring up too much crap. But yep. I'll just bleep out when I said Zon, and nobody will know what we're talking about. So it's yeah, good. exactly. <laughs> so I got a question. So is your dad pop in? Is he out of the lab? Is he in the lab part time now that you're fully exchanged he still comes in about an hour to a day my dad's uh, he's what 70 72 you know and i i don't know if he'll ever like completely walk away yeah just because i mean he it's kind of sad but you know he plays golf him and my mom never really had kind of the best (laughs) marriage so (laughs) i don't think they really like to be around each other anyway so (laughs) and so yeah he he comes in and trims some dyes they always trim dyes that's all they do. <laughs> that is well, so true. Yeah, that's what my dad one. did. Yeah. For him, I mean, my dad was all, he was a well rounded technician, really good, but it's like, I mean, he just honestly, he's not good at anything anymore other than that. So yep. he doesn't get on the computer, so he won't put notes on the computer. So he's really like a liability because he'll, <laughs> he'll get in. I mean, we, we actually had a, a technician that quit the other day, and my dad was like trying to tell him a different way to do it than what the manager was telling him. And I know y'all know what that's like yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, screw it. You know, I'm out. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, right now, I, I don't know if y'all see this too, but it's like, it's like people will quit over anything. Oh yeah. It. Oh yeah. Harold was talking about that. He has one of my favorite lines. He goes, you're quitting, but you're scanning dies. <laughs> <laughs> it's nuts. I mean, I hope that this will shift, but it's like, I mean, it's almost like this. I mean, I'll go ahead and say it. It's like, there's a, it's like the, the, the employees have control. Yeah. You know, if you overwork them, they're just going to quit and go somewhere. I mean, they can get a job anywhere, yeah. right? I mean, there's yeah. hiring. They can go to Florida and get a job. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, you know, I had a couple of employees that left, you know, last year and moved to Florida, you know, mm-hmm. just just decided, you know, wanted to move to the coast. Yeah. You know, you know and, I, and I get it. I mean, I get it. Look, you, you live one life and I, I think finding that work-life balance is important for everybody. And this industry, unfortunately, makes there is it. None. <laughs> You know, Bob, the problem is, is I think all of us are going to have to find a way to make it that. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, it's always just been accepted that that's how it is, but people do not work that way anymore. They're mm-hmm. not going to work like that. I mean, they will not. So we've got ones here that are, you know, like our age and, you know, older and maybe even a little younger that are that are willing to do that. But it's not the, this younger generation. Hell no. You know, they're looking at 35 hours a week, you know? Their time is more valuable than their paycheck or their pension or their retirement. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm really interested to see how this works in our industry with all the, you know, the price shifts and things, you know, all of our zirconia prices with the groups, you know, our average sales prices. Are, I don't know if y'all's are, but I know ours is steadily declines each year, mostly because of our group. Oh, sure. Our group pricing. And it's like with these prices coming down, even with us trying to gain some efficiencies, where is this money going to come from? Yeah, be able to pay higher wages 
yeah. for a technician and have more of them too, right? Because I mean, if they're going to be not working as many hours, that means we're just going to have to have more of them. We're going to have to have part-time technicians, which is crazy to even think of that. Yeah. That even <laughs> so. Yeah, we're facing the same thing. You know, they you sign those contracts over and, you know, you give them the lesser prices and they say, well, the volume is going to be the differentiator for the pricing. And yet the volume is what it's tough for the labs to be able to fabricate the volume at that price. It's just like a never ending freaking circle. I hate it. It is. You know, and then we've got, you know, of course, the, the this minimum wage that's slowly you know, raising up or just, a, I don't know if y'all seen that too, but it's just with everything going on. I mean, it seems like that we're having to just give more increases and mm-hmm. I, you know, like bigger increases and more frequent than what we normally have just because of what's, you know, people can go out there and get, you know, 15, $16 an hour jobs doing, I mean, flipping hamburgers. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, that, that kind of makes me a little nervous with the future is like how we're going to be able to have things like a price increase. And I don't even know if y'all know what that is. Yeah. A price increase. Yeah. I don't even know when we last had oh, one. Oh, I know. I, we never did it at the lab I was at. I'm not even really sure how that works, but I feel like we're going to, you know, just the economics of it, we're going to have to. Yeah. Hey, Barb, I don't know at your lab, but if you guys have found all the efficiencies that you can, but I kind of feel like with us, there's always some more that you can find, but mm-hmm. I don't feel like there's a lot more, you yeah. know, like I know. Us, uh, Daxon, you better grab a handpiece, get on that bench. Come on, man. Y'all might as well go ahead and put a fork in me if that happens. Titanic <laughs> <laughs> is sinking if that happens. That's my final salute. Yeah. <laughs> so early on, you had mentioned um, impression scanning. So you guys are still doing that. And if so, I'm certain our listeners would want to know, what's the best scanner for that? And is it the impression material? You know, different impression materials do better or do worse? Maybe you're not doing it anymore, but I'm curious about that. We are not doing it currently. Okay. It's almost like digital dentures, but but more that that project has been going on with yeah. us for three years, and we are trying. I mean, I think the last run that we were doing is we were actually pouring a dye, trimming the dye, yeah, in an impression, and then trying to marry those two together. And yeah. we were just and we used three shape. Now yeah. I've heard that in ExoCAD it's a little bit easier, but you know I've never used ExoCAD. Yeah, we were having more issues getting the dye to marry. Yeah, that trimmed out, married yeah. an impression. Yeah, I think between that and just really picking out the impressions that were for Good us enough. <laughs> enough yeah, it's like you know you you end up with like I don't know like twenty yeah. percent. Yeah, it's like so this is and then you got the time that it takes to find those twenty percent, and so it's like what have you really gained? Yep. So I don't know. I, I mean, to me, I don't know where the future is on the impression scanning because I've not talked to anybody mm-hmm. that has done that over any period of you know time that says that they're very happy with it. Yep. Agree. That's, that's why I asked because I had the exact same experience and we did things exactly the same way, poured the dye, trimmed the dye and, you know, scanned the impression, printed a model. It was just a pain in the ass and it, and it was never successful and less than probably 20% were even any good to, to try it on. So I agree. I haven't tried this, but I mean, I've, I've, I've had talked to a couple of people and it, the, the idea this kind of makes a little sense is looking at like a cone beam, you know, scanner to scan a PBS impression, like something that can scan little details, right? That can kind of capture. Cause that's one of the issues if, with those margins that, that we have to like trim and flake away, you know, the stone to reveal, yep. if you're able to scan through that material, you, you know, maybe that could work. But again, I don't know how you would, you can't digitally nope. flake away. I don't know. I, it, it, I just, I don't know what's going to be the answer on that or if there ever will be one, you know, cause it doesn't seem like it's a software issue. Yeah. You know, more of a, it's a scanning. I don't know. Yeah. As soon as we figure it out, everybody will be doing digital impressions. So yeah, that's, too late. Yeah. <laughs> right. so I think that's kind of what's happening too, is people are kind of, you know, that the, there's a lot of these digital impression companies are getting a lot more aggressive and pricing and offerings. And that seems to be that you're, the digital is continuing to grow at a higher rate. Maybe that is what's going to happen. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not, I'll tell you this, we're not putting any more effort into it until somebody can tell me a recipe that makes sense. Yeah. Same here. Oh, we have spent a lot of time and money on that yeah. and actually lost some accounts over it too. Really? Yep. Mm-hmm. For sure. Same here. We bought the holder for the impression and I think we did it twice. That was it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I don't think anybody got it right. Nope. No. Not that I know of. And, uh, you know, we'll say this, we just throwing this out there. We just went live with magic touch software on Monday. So oh. this has been a, 
This has been one of those weeks. Mm, good luck. No, 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 no. <laughs> Fine. It has been, I, I tell you, between being shorthanded and going live with the new software, I just had an employee that came and looked at my window. It's like, look like he's about to beat somebody up. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty tense around here right now. But I, I am excited for the software. I think it's going to give us a lot of things that we haven't had. But but it's been 15 years since we changed software, so this is this has been a it's been a tough week. I bet that's a lot to take on. <laughs> yeah, especially shorthanded, right? <sighs> yep. Well, awesome, Dex, and that's some really good stuff, man. I didn't know that about your dad and you taking over the lab. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's been fun, man. Yeah, I think the industry, what's kept me here, honestly, is just the, the change. I love, I think if the, if it was still how it was when I started, there's no way I would still be here. Mm. You know, if everything was still, you know, hand layered and, and that's, that was the only way that we could do stuff is, you know, the traditional methods. But yeah. I definitely love the shift to the, the technology side of things. I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's the only option that we have nowadays, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. To grow that air scale. But I've always been really interested in that. You made good points during this whole conversation. Technology doesn't always work. Mm -mm. It's not yeah. always perfect. Mm -mm. But you learn from it. You grow from it and uh, utilize other people in the industry. And I think that's something that our industry needs to probably do, even a, maybe a better job or more structure than what we're doing now is like, there's a lot of things in the lab that can be automated today that aren't. And the problem is labs like me and probably like Barb, like we can't fund the R and D to figuring some of these things out. I mean, I'm thinking, I'm talking about even like up front in your administrative and shipping or yeah. saving area. You yeah. know, there's a lot of things that we, that we could automate up there, but where does a lab like mine start with? I don't just have a hundred thousand dollars. I can throw at a project like that, you know, from an R and D standpoint, but maybe yeah. some of those things that we need as our industry, we need to maybe try to, you know, tackle together, right. As a group and figure out a way that we can split the costs on some R and D areas like that. And like I said, I'm talking about things that may not even be manufacturing, sure. maybe more, you know, other parts of our processes. Cause I think that we're going to have to get there. We know the monster in the country is going to get there oh, before yeah. everyone else anyway. Yep. So it's like, how do we get there or start working towards that? Even those are some things I think that we need to kind of figure out as an industry, a way to, to work together yep. to address some of those. Yeah. Rather than just a couple of labs shooting ideas back and forth, a little something yeah. a little bit more structured. No, I mean, it's good. Yeah. I think it's it's interesting. Yeah. So Daxon, one final question. Yep. I want to know how close your lab is to Graceland. <laughs> Aww, Elvis. So we are about it's probably about a twenty five minute car ride. And this is embarrassing to admit. I've lived in Memphis my whole life. I've actually never been to Graceland. Oh my gosh. Well that's okay. I'm in Indianapolis, never been to the five hundred, so yeah. It's just one of those things. <laughs> You know, man, it's it's kind of sad because it's in the, the part of town that it's in. It's not which, great. <laughs> yeah, it's actually quite dangerous. Yeah, um, I had my car broken in when I was there once. Yeah, it's it's definitely a, a place that brings a lot of tourism, to, you know, to the area for sure. But yeah, when you drive in and you see and you drive around there, it's like, man, you know, you keep your windows rolled up, you come to stoplight. <laughs> yeah. Pray for your life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you definitely want to be very careful for sure. Yeah, they warn you at the Graceland Hotel. They said, don't go out at night. Damn. Yeah, I've been to the, the Graceland Hotel. We've had a couple of CE events there, and it's actually a pretty cool venue. Yeah. Uh, but as far as like going through the actual Graceland, you know, I never was an, you know, an Elvis fan. So it, I thought you were required to by law over there. I mean, well, no. <laughs> you know, that's just another area I broke the law. I guess. <laughs> so. Well, maybe one day when I go back, I'm going to stop by Ardent. Yeah. And two or two great facilities. Hey, and maybe you can take me to Graceland. How there you that? go. There you go. Awesome. Love it. Well, thank awesome, you. Awesome, Jackson. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Yeah, man, I enjoyed it. It was good catching up with y'all, and hopefully, you know, we can all kind of get, get back to seeing each other again. I know it's – I'm looking forward to it. What's, Heck, what's, yeah. What's the, next meeting? What's, the, what's the next big meeting that's coming up? Lab Day West at the end of the month. I've never been to Lab Day West. Neither have I. It's my yeah. first time going. I'm excited. Oh, cool. Wow. Have well, fun. cool. And then I guess the Lab Day Chicago is going to be same time again next year. Is that right? I Are hope so. It's not official, but yeah, I can't imagine that they would change it. I know the dentist side, I think they've announced the dates. Okay. We're having the Cal Lab meeting. I can tell you that. Yeah. No Yay. matter what. Yep. We'll be there. Yeah. Well, I always love the Cal Lab. That's been my favorite part of coming to Chicago, at least for the last you know, probably years. Yeah. Um, like, I feel like I get more out of that than I do. Yep the whole rest of the meeting. Yeah. yeah. You're a front rower like me. <laughs> I've, seen, oh, yeah. I've seen you up there. <laughs> yeah. No, I enjoyed it. It's, it's, it's always a good meeting. 
Cool. Awesome, Daxon. Well, have a great weekend, man. We'll talk to you soon. Y'all too. It's good talking to you. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Have a Take good one. Care. You too. Bye. Grow3x is a dental supply service and marketing company. It was founded by Norbert Ulmer, and their goal is to help dental labs, especially small labs, to lower their costs for supplies, to provide business opportunities, and help them generate growth. They really want to help labs as they know how difficult it can be competing with larger lab groups. One of the things that they have going on right now is their upcoming Grow3x Gem Talks. It's on November 5th in Charlotte, North Carolina. What is a Grow3x Gem Talks? Well, it's an all-day marketing symposium in a TED Talk style, featuring some 10-plus lab speakers as they share their most relevant and practical marketing techniques. We will hear from Sasha. <laughs> we will hear from Sasha from Harvest Dental, Ann Kelser from AMK Dental Lab, Frankie Acosta from AA Dental Design, and Ricky Braswell from Beyond Coaching and former co-executive director of the NADL. A few past podcast guests are on that list. All of them will talk about real marketing that is is done in their own labs and businesses every day. Register now at growth3x.com to take advantage of their early bird special of only $95. And if you enter the discount BFTB for Voices from the Bench, you'll receive an extra 10% discount just because you listen to this podcast. We can't wait to see you at Grow3x Gym Talks in Charlotte on November 5th. Big thanks to Daxon for coming on our podcast and talking about your constant journey. It's nice to hear that not every successful lab owner is full of only successes. You know, we've been there, done that. It's very common in our industry to hire staff from the clinical side, and it seems as though you have hired yourself a winner. So good luck with her. Thanks for all that you have done for our industry and sharing so much with us. Awesome. Well, that's all we got for you. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. 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 I don't know. I don't know.